my hair first. Because I walked into church this morning and the whole fourth floor went, Whoa! Pastor Jennifer! And, and, then, and I said, is it the haircut or the hairstyle? Oh, we love it! You look so young! <laughs> and I told them, and I'm telling you now, because I know some of you, are, you've already told me that also this morning as I walked in down here, haircut's one thing. But the hairdresser took 45 minutes to make it look like this. Your pastor is not going to take 45 minutes to make it look like this. So enjoy it if you like it. You'll never see it this way again. Until, until the next time I go to the hairdresser and he cuts it. How about that? But in my heart, I'm still the same pastor. <laughs> Amen. 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 Praise the Lord for hairdressers. <laughs> oh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Didn't we have a good time praising and worshiping the Lord this morning? Yes. Just a, The Holy Spirit's so good, isn't He? When we gather in His name, he, he prepares gifts for us because He loves us so much and He's God that we weren't expecting, you know, that we didn't know that this is, what, this is how He's going to speak to us today. And what a wonderful time of being lifted up and really being strengthened in our spirits that our, our Lord is great, that He's above all. He's above all else and He's over everything. Praise the Lord. And it's a reminder to us, not just this morning, but as we go through our days and as our weeks, for the things that are ahead, because the Lord knows what is ahead as well. And who knows but what, this morning, what we received in blessing the Lord and in understanding more about Him, as that is encouraged and as, as that encourages us and as that, is, as that strengthens our hearts, that the Holy Spirit will use that in the days ahead and in the weeks ahead to re remind us of that at the time that we need it. And, and God is so good to do that. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 It is. Praise the Lord. We want to continue this morning. Uh, are we... Uh, who's taking care of the kids? Do we have anyone taking care of the kids? Well, thanks, Miss Jean. Kingsley and Blessing, if you'd like to go with Auntie Jean. David, you're too big. Okay. Thank you, Jean. We continue this morning with how we grow, and you know what we're going to be talking about, and I'm so excited uh, that we, we finally made it here. After getting close for several weeks, we finally made it here. We go ahead and look at the next slide. This morning we're going to be talking. Uh, go ahead and move to the next slide. What are we going to be talking about? We know what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about prayer this morning. And if you remember last week, I asked you what were some of your, what, how would you define or what would you say prayer is? And what were some of the things that you said? A anyone. Prayer is what? Fellowshipping with God. Talking to the Lord. Anybody else? Getting closer to God. Connecting with Him. Expressing our heart to Him. Communicating with Him. All of these things. And they all have a common thread, don't we? They all have, they, they, don't they? And they all describe this process, this, this wonderful gift that we call prayer. And so we're going to talk about this, that this morning and how prayer, we'll begin to talk about how prayer helps us to grow. You know, if we were to talk about prayer, we could speak for weeks and weeks and weeks and never come to the end of it. There's so much that we could say about prayer. But we want to look this morning, focus on, I think, the things that God would have us look at. Uh, we see it when we talk about prayer. We see prayer life in one person in the, in the Bible more than any other person. And that is the man, Jesus, and the Lord come to earth, Jesus Christ. And we see it in His life as He lived here as a man. And what a good reminder for you and for me when we feel strong and when we feel in ourselves, I can do it and I can make it. Because that's how we act sometimes, isn't it? We, we sort of make it on our own, don't we? And yet Jesus gave us this wonderful pattern in the years that He walked on this earth. And He gave us the pattern not just as a pattern for us to follow, but the things that He did, He did because He needed to do those as a man. 
And the life of Jesus that we see is a life of prayer. It's the life of prayer. Here is, of all the people, of all that walked on this earth, if anybody could do without prayer, if anybody could skimp on prayer, if anyone could cut short and just sort of cruise, it would have been Jesus, right? And yet Jesus is the one that we see that his life was anchored in prayer. He's anchored in prayer, so we see it. And then you'll remember we talked about the Word last week because what we see in the New Testament is seen in the Old Testament as well. Remember I gave you the example of the daily Word as we see it in the manna that came to the children of Israel as they walked in the, in the wilderness day after day after day. And it was a reminder to us that we need the Word of God in our lives on a regular basis and on a daily basis. Well, let me ask you something. If we see that in the Word, which is one of the nutrients for our growth, one of the essential things for our Christian life, do we see that same, do we see that same picture, do we see a symbol in the Old Testament for prayer? We, we, see it in, we see it in manna as the bread, the Word of God. Is there any sort of symbol in the Old Testament that would show us the necessity for ongoing prayer as well? Anybody think about that just a minute. Anybody have an answer for that? You might say, yes, 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 I know that. This one's a little bit more, this one's not quite as easy to see as manna, which was very, very open. Anybody? Think in, about the tabernacle, okay? Let your mind go towards the tabernacle and think about what took place, what was going on inside the holy place. So here was the tabernacle, and that was where God and man would meet in the Old Testament, right? So God and man would meet. Then you go into the tabernacle, in, into the uh, outer court, and then inside is the holy place, and then the holy of holies. What was happening inside the holy place 24 hours a day? There we go. Incense was being burned day and night day and night on the altar of incense inside the holy place. Now, the Old Testament and the New Testament tell us what incense symbolizes. What does incense symbolize? You know the answer now. Incense symbolized in a symbol and in a picture form prayer. Some of us sometimes wonder, those, those of you that come from a Catholic background, you know, sometimes you, you, maybe you haven't even thought about it. Why is incense burned not just in the Catholic Church, but in other churches as well? They go all the way back and they talk about the, the symbol. Incense was a symbol of prayer. But here's the wonderful thing. We don't need the symbol anymore, do we? Because we have the reality. And brothers and sisters, let me go off the side for just a minute. Listen carefully. When you and I have the reality in Christ, the reality in Christ, then we no longer need those symbols. We no longer need those symbols. And so we don't burn incense. Any, that's why we don't burn incense, because we have the reality of prayer. But in the Old Testament, it was a picture that incense was, was on, put on the altar of incense, and it was very clear. You go back and look at the Old Testament. Do you know what God told Moses and for the priests, for the high, the priests and the high priests that would go in? Do you know what he told them? He said, never let the incense, the altar of incense, never let it go out. Never let let there be a time when that incense is not burning on the altar. And then in the Old Testament and the New Testament, what does it say about incense? It says the incense, it was, it represented, it was the prayers of the saints rising, right? Rising. Oh, some of you say, oh, that's what that means. That's what it means. That's what it means. And so we see in the Old Testament, and then we see it again in the New Testament in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the prayers of the saints continually rising. And that's a wonderful picture. Now, there are times when you and I are sleeping. Let me, let me make it literal for just a minute. But think about all around the world, all the different time zones, the days and the nights. Isn't it a beautiful picture? And isn't it a beautiful reminder to know that around this world, God's people, 
God's saints. You're his saint. I'm his saint. We are Saint means a holy one, the one who's set apart. So I'm Saint Jennifer. You are Saint Christine. You are Saint... You know. <laughs> Jashing. We're saints. Around the world, around the earth, there are saints, God's chosen holy people, who are praying. Imagine that, just like the incense in the Old Testament that was always rising. There's never a time in this earth when God's people are not praying. And to the Lord, because when they burned incense, it smelled sweet, to, it, it smelled sweet didn't it? And you know what the Lord says? The Lord says, your prayers to me are a sweet smell, a sweet aroma, a sweet uh, fragrance is what the word that's used sometimes. And that makes me, we'll get to this a little bit later, but me, that to use a very common, sorry, this is not very lofty language, it sort of blows my mind a little bit. It really does, and as I said, that's not very lofty language. Here's the God of the universe, the Lord of all the earth, the Lord of creation, the, 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 as we sing sometimes, the potentate of time, the ruler of all time, who made everything, who existed before anything existed. And you know what he says to you and to me? He says, your prayers to me are a sweet aroma, a sweet fragrance. I can't even understand that. How could God feel that way? about my prayers, and yet he says he does. And so the picture we see in the Old Testament, to go back to what we started on, is a picture of unceasing prayer. Unceasing prayer. And that is to be what our lives are like. And, and some of us may say, well, Pastor Jennifer, how can there be unceasing prayer? Sometimes I have to pay attention to this, I have to pay attention to that. And that's not what the Bible means at all. But what it means is there's an open communication always between you and me and the Lord. That at any time, that we can just, there's a, there's a communication, there's an open door, day and night at any time. And that's the picture in the Old Testament of the incense that's being burned that's always rising to the Lord. Isn't that a wonderful picture? A wonderful picture. And that's what the Lord describes prayer as. That's the picture He gives us in the Old Testament. So we see it in that, and, and that's a lovely study. Maybe some other time we'll talk about that again. That's an Old Testament symbol of New Testament reality in our lives. And we see it uh, then we, we go on a little bit further. Let's go on to the next slide. Let's move to the New Testament. And we see in the New Testament, I'll always think about it this way, almost, almost always, in the Old Testament, we will see things in picture form or in symbol form. When we come to the New Testament, then we will see it in reality in our lives. And we'll see it in the lives of saints. Um, uh, throughout throughout time. And what we see in the New Testament is what our lives are supposed to be like as well. That's what our lives, this is the picture of the church, and that's what our lives are supposed to be like. So we look at the writings of Paul and he says to Ephesians, he tells them and he tells us, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Every occasion. That means, brothers and sisters, that there is not a thing that you do and that I do, there's not an activity, there's, n there's nothing that we are involved in that has to be excluded from prayer, from communication with the Lord. I've told you before that uh, so many, uh, the example I gave you when I was studying in school and I couldn't, and I couldn't understand algebra. Remember that? And I got down on my knees and I prayed. And God gave me the... And I, I was crying and praying. It was not a prayer of faith. It was really a prayer of desperation. And God answered my prayer. God answered my prayer. But I, here's this picture for us. And what an encouragement for us. There's not a thing that we go through that is not important to God because we're His, we're his child. We're His children. Parents, let me ask you something. Let me ask you something. Now, I know sometimes our kids... Your kids get involved in trivial, unimportant things. Yes? But if it touches their heart and it touches their life, don't you care about it because it touches them? Yes or no? Yes. If it makes them happy, you're glad. If it makes them sad and burdens them, even if it's a small thing, do you care about it? 
Yes, you care about it. Not because of that thing, but because of your child. Because of relationship. Because of relationship. And that's the same picture that we see here. So pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. My cat was a little bit sick this week. I know you say, oh, Pastor Jennifer's going to talk about her cat again. She is. And I had to call the vet, and the vet had to get some blood. I'm giving you a specific example. Please. I'll get to more serious things in just a minute, but this is an example. And the vet said, we've got to get some blood from Lucy. And you know, my Lucy cat is really fierce. She's really, really fierce. And she started making noise. I'll, I'll make it a very short story. It was not a pretty thing. And he looked at it, and he changed the needle. He tried three times. And oh, it was really terrible. And I was standing there. I said, do you need my help? And I was, I was just crying because it was so awful. And Lucy was crying too because she was so scared and she was angry. And, and, and he kept on trying. I thought, oh. And finally, the third time, and I really mean this, and there are far more important things that touch our lives. The third time, I just started praying. And I hadn't prayed before that. I, third time, out loud. And I thought, I don't care what the vet thinks and I don't care what the assistant thinks either. I really don't. And I just said, oh, out loud, I just said, Oh God, please help, please help him. Lord, please help him to, to be able to get this blood. Lord, help, Lord, make it, make it work. And the Lord answered prayer and very quickly and very easily the next time that he was able to. Now that's just a small example. You don't care about my cat. I know that. You don't care about my cat. But I care about my cat. Because it's my cat, right? And you know what? The Lord cared because it was touching my heart. And so the Lord answered prayer. And that's a, a, a very light example. But what I want to say to you is this. If in that situation, the Lord would listen and would answer prayer for, uh, for a cat, an old cat, don't you think He cares about all the various things that touch your life? Surely He does. And so Paul says, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Now, in just a minute we're going to talk about what in the Spirit means. Does that mean speaking in other tongues? We'll talk about that in just a minute because um, a lot of people have questions about that, so hold on to that in just a minute. But we'll go a little bit further. And so, But what that means to us and what I want us to grab from this is that there's nothing in your life, there's nothing in your life that is too trivial or too small just to breathe a prayer to the Lord about as you're doing it, as you're doing it. And so this is what Paul says to you and to me. And then we see in Colossians 1, 3, and this was in his own life, and here we see the pattern of the life of Paul. What does he say? He says, we always pray for you, and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what, a, what an important topic, isn't it? Much more important than a little animal. He says, we're praying for you, and we give thanks for you. As I did this morning, as I was driving in, I was praying, I was praying, and I was thanking the Lord for Lighthouse, and praying that God would strengthen you, and equip you, and shower you with blessings. And when we see in 1 Thessalonians as well. What does Paul say? He says, we always thank God for all of you. We pray for you constantly. We pray for you constantly. Think about what it would have been like to have been around the Apostle Paul, because he's always talking about prayer. That's 1 Thessalonians 1. Uh, it says 2 and 3, but I think maybe it's verse 2. Um, we always thank God. We're always praying for you constantly. Do you think Paul was dropping to his knees all the time? No. I think Paul was walking through the streets. I think Paul was sitting down. I think Paul was in marketplaces. Paul was doing all of these things. And I can imagine our brother Paul just speaking in Greek, which he would have spoken, or uh, Aramaic, which he also would have spoken, or maybe sometimes some, some Hebrew, which he would have known, or probably praying in tongues much of the time, praying for all of these believers. Can't you imagine that? Walking through the streets and just saying, oh God, strengthen those believers in Thessalonians. It's probably praying in the Spirit. Here's the pattern in the life of Paul. We go a little bit further, still in 1 Thessalonians 3 and 3.10. Boy, he really loved these believers, didn't he? In Thessalonians, he really had them on his heart. Night and day, we pray earnestly for you. Asking God to let us see you again, to fill the gaps in your faith. So here we have not just what he says to others, 
but the, uh, the practice in his own life as well. And there are many, many more. I'm just showing you, we're looking at just a few scriptures this morning. And then I want us to look at another thing. Here's in the life of Paul a little bit later. Now I want us to back up and let's look at prayer in the life of the early church, the very beginnings of the church. And let's look at Acts chapter 2 verse 42. And let's look at what we read here, what we see here. This is right after the day of Pentecost when God the Father, God the Son, sent God the Holy Spirit and God the Holy Spirit, all three in cooperation, came to earth and indwelled believers and filled them with himself and it overflowed in tongues of every sort and the believers were empowered and the church began to grow and many, many people on that day alone came to the Lord. Now, let's take a snapshot of the early church. This is Acts 2.42, so this is right after the day of Pentecost. What is happening in the early church? All the believers, all, oh, not just some of them, not just the most spiritual ones, not the most mature ones, but all of them. You see, except for, they, all, they were all baby Christians. All of them were baby Christians, except for those few that had, follow, had been following the Lord Jesus Christ, and they devoted themselves to what? Devoted means, by the way, devoted means to really fix your attention and your energy on something. It means to be single-minded in what you do. That's what that word means, to devote. Um, they devoted themselves to what? To the apostles' teaching. Now, what is the apostles' teaching? We've already talked about it. What is it? The gospel. Really, the, what we would say now, the word of God. And we've been talking about nutrient for growth, the Word of God. So what they had at that point was the teaching that the apostles had received from the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what they were teaching. It was the gospel. So it was the Word of God. So the believers devoted themselves to the Word. Okay? And we've talked about that already. What's the next thing? To fellowship. Okay? To fellowship, to being, to being together. Have we talked about that as part of growth? We have, haven't we? That the best environment for growth is in fellowship. And I think nobody really told them, now you should be fellowshipping, now you should be whatever. It was the pull of their heart. Brothers and sisters, when the Holy Spirit lives in us, and when the Holy Spirit has His way in our lives, He will do in us all of these things. He will pull us into the right order and into the right things in the Kingdom of God and in our Christian lives. So to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, Okay, that was the command of Jesus, wasn't it? He said, you do this until I come again. So there was that. The sharing in the meals was an outgrowth or part of the fellowship. And that's one of the things I see as I look at this. I was looking at this and I was thinking about Lighthouse. And I was thinking how we fit with this. And generally, I think Lighthouse does pretty well, quite well in some, in some of these, especially, especially if you go up to the fourth floor on Sundays, okay? But not just that. So often I see all of you, one of the things we often do is encourage you, go out and eat with others. Go out together. Find somebody. Go somewhere. Go eat together. Why? That is part of the pattern of the church. It's part of the pattern. So they devoted themselves to that. And what is the last thing they devoted themselves to? There we go. And to prayer. And to prayer. So what we see in this snapshot and in this picture is the pattern for healthy growth, both individually and for the church. And so what I would say to you this morning is this. As you look at this snapshot, I would ask you personally and individually, how do you fit with this pattern? How do you fit with this pattern? And it's not for me to come to you and say, you are not doing this, you should do this better. Between you and the Holy Spirit, because He's going to work in you, how do you fit in this pattern of healthy life and healthy growth in the church? And if there's some corrections that you should make, then make them with the help of the Holy Spirit. He'll help you get healthy. He'll help you get healthy. That's what He wants to do, right? And then, so we see this, it's the heartbeat and the life of the church. It was not an extra activity that was added to everything else they had to do, but it was, it was the priority of their lives. Now, let me pause for just a minute, because some of us might think, yes, but Pastor Jennifer, this is 2,000 years later. That was the first century. This is the 21st century. And that was in 
Jerusalem, and we are in Hong Kong. We are just too busy. We can't do that. What I want to say to you is this. It's not a matter of change in centuries, and it's not a matter of change in technology or change in cultures or societies. It is a matter of priority, and it's a matter of the heart. And so in our 21st century lives in Hong Kong, the pattern that we see here should be our pattern as well. It doesn't mean that you have to lay down your work and you can't do other things, but it does mean that the pattern that you see here should be a priority for your life if you're going to grow as a Christian and if you're going to be healthy as a Christian. It may be hard, it's not easy to do, but the Lord will help you because He wants you to be healthy and He knows that you have to work. He knows the pull on your time. He knows the many things that, that pull you. I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And yet, in 21st century Hong Kong, the Lord Jesus Christ says to you and to me through the Holy Spirit, devote yourselves to the Word, to fellowship, to sharing in meals and the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. That's what the Lord says to us this morning. You know what comes at the end of this passage? There's a great gift that comes at the end of this passage. The end of this passage says, And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. That's what it says a few verses later. The Lord added to their fellowship. You see, brothers and sisters, when your life is in the right order with God, in the right order, and you have the right priorities in your life, do you know what's going to happen? Your Christian life is going to overflow into the lives of the people around you, the people that you work with, the people for whom you work, and people all around you, and they will be drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in Hong Kong, as we are correctly in line with the Lord, in all of these areas, the Lord will add to the church those who are being saved. That's the pattern of healthy church. Amen? Amen. 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 The power for building our Christian lives comes from prayer. Comes from prayer. And I want us to look at the next, um, at the next verse in Jude 20. And we see in Jude 20, I'll move out of the way. Um, remember Jude is only one chapter, so there's no chapter one. It's just Jude 20, Jude verse 20. Uh, this was the other, this uh, Jude is the other, the earthly half-brother of Jesus as well. But notice that he focuses on the Lord, not on himself. And Jude says, you dear friends must build each other up in your most holy faith, praying or pray, I've, I've added this, praying in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you go back and look at this, and I want us to keep here for just a minute, here's this beautiful picture, and if you read all of Jude, you'll also see that he talks about the Word of God, and then there's prayer that goes with us, with this. But when Jude writes this, he is not saying, number one, build each other up in your holy faith. Number two, pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the original language and the way the sentence is put together, what it means is this. The, the primary meaning is this. The, I shouldn't say the primary meaning. The connection is this. Praying in the power of the Holy Spirit builds you up. That's what it means. Praying in the power of the Holy Spirit builds you up. Now, let me say something right here. Does this mean, right here, praying in other tongues? No. Did you know that? That's not what it means here. Although there is a place for that, and we are built up in that. This means praying in cooperation with, and in partnership with, and according to the Holy Spirit. That's what that means there. That means that you are praying... The Holy Spirit is praying with you. Here's the great thing, brothers and sisters, and that's what I, I wanted to, the point I wanted to, to, definitely wanted to get to this morning. Here's this thing that you and I think of as a burden sometimes, right? Yes or no? Yes. That's right. You and I sometimes feel guilty about. 
You and I look at it as a duty. And the God of all the universe, the creator of everything, of time, everything is in his hands, the one that we sang about this morning. Instead, he looks at prayer as, he said, here's this gift that I've, that I've given these people I love, that if they will pray, I'm going to pray with them. If they will open up their heart and their life and their time just to call out and to wait long enough in my presence and to take time to communicate with me, the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, is going to come alongside us, not just walk with us and help us in difficult times, not just, not just give us an answer to prayer, not just equip us and empower us, but He Himself is going to partner with us in prayer. How many of you have a prayer partner? Yes or no? You have a prayer partner, somebody that you pray with at times. Yes? Somebody that you like to pray with at times. Let's get together. Let's pray. And you like praying with that person, right? They encourage you and you feel good. And as you pray, your prayers, you pray with more faith too, right? You're praying together. You're strengthened. You don't feel so weak and you don't feel so wimpy anymore. Oh, brothers and sisters, here is the best prayer partner you will ever have and one who is guaranteed, who is guaranteed. He comes with you and joins with you in prayer. Oh, and that helps us to see how as we pray with the Spirit, in the Spirit, according to Him, in cooperation with Him, that we are strengthened. And so Jude says, you will build yourselves up as you pray in the power of the Spirit. You will be built up. You will be built up. Now you say, oh, but Pastor Jennifer, it doesn't say anything about growing here. Ah, here is one of the almost synonymous terms, pretty much synonymous terms for growth. And that is buildings or building yourself up or building each other up. It's the same idea. It's the same idea. And he says, you build each other up. Now, do you see the picture there? You, you, you will be built up, but who else is built up? You build each other up. So there's this place for corporate prayer. We're praying with each other. We're praying in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Do you know there are times I love praying with people who love to pray. Don't you? I love, it helps me. Because sometimes I feel, I don't know about you, sometimes me, pastor, I feel a little bit weak or wimpy in my own prayers. I'm praying and it feels like my faith is so small. I'm praying and it seems like my prayers are hitting the roof and coming down. But maybe I'm praying with somebody else who's really praying also. And you know what happens? Because God the Holy Spirit is there, suddenly my friend that I'm praying with starts praying with anointing and really with power. And I feel, and you feel it too, don't you? There's a sudden a lift of the Holy Spirit and suddenly that person is no longer praying words just from their minds God this 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 and this suddenly that person is being lifted up in the power of the Holy Spirit and you can tell they're praying from heaven right God is giving them words from heaven. Why from heaven? Because it is God's will. And He drops that and He empowers us and it goes into our hearts and into our lives. And as we pray, wow, faith rises, doesn't it? And as faith rises, oh, our faith, then my faith is built and I start seeing not the problem. I start seeing not the need. I start seeing not the, oh God, the answer that we must have. That's all part of prayer. But then what do we see? Who do we see when we start praying like that? We see God, don't we? We see God when we start praying like that. Our eyes get off of, oh God, please this, God, please that. And instead, we get hooked into and set, setting our eyes upon the one who is overall, the one that we sang about this morning. And our, we are lifted in faith. We're lifted in faith because it's the prayers of the Holy Spirit. And that's how we build each other up in our, in our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. There is the place for corporate prayer. There's the place for corporate prayer. And there will be times in prayer when it will be your friend who really has strength in prayer. And God just breathes in and then it helps you as well. And there will be other times that as you give yourself to prayer, God will really pray through you and others will be encouraged as well. And you know what? You don't need anybody
to tell you. Now you see, just then, when that person prayed, that's what I was talking about. Do you? Do you need anybody to tell you? No. When, when you hear the Holy Spirit praying through people, you know it, don't you? You know it. It's the voice of God. It's the heartbeat of God. And so this is what Jude says here. And this is this beautiful picture of prayer. And so the word building up is used here instead of growth. Okay? Now, hang on to that. We're going to go a little bit further. Let's look at, let's go a little bit further. Prayer. So prayer keeps us centered on God on what God is doing in our lives. It keeps our eyes on Him and our goals are changed as we pray. And so we're being built up. There is, a, there is another place, um, and let me just mention it. It's in, uh, in 1, 1 Corinthians 14 when he talks about praying in other tongues. And if you'll look at that, do you know what it says? It says that he that prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself. Okay, that's first, uh, I'm sure it's first Corinthians 14, I think maybe verse 2 or something like that, 2 or 3 or something like that. So you've got to take that and put that in with prayer as well. He that prays in an unknown tongue edifies. Edifies is the King James word. Give me a translation for edifies. There you go. He that prays in an unknown tongue builds himself up. So here we see the other picture of that. You know what? I don't even really understand that. I understand that less than I do understand Jude 20. But Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit himself, says that when you pray in an unknown tongue, that's praying in tongues, the language that God gives in pray, as you are praying, but it's the Holy Spirit praying through you. Paul says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that you are building yourself up. You're strengthening yourself. You're strengthening yourself. You know, we come from many church backgrounds, but when I read things like this, and there are many more things we could say about it, when I read that, for me, the discussions and the controversies and the disagreements that people sometimes have about speaking in tongues and things like that. Do you know when I read, and, I'm, and I, I don't want to argue, I don't argue about things like this, but when I read something like that, for me, it's really kind of logical. Why would God take away a gift and say, well, this great gift, it's only for back then in the early church, when that gift, with the gift that God gives, you're being built up. Would a good God do that? I don't think so. I don't think so. And for me, that's just, a, that's just an, an easy that's an easy way of looking at it. There are a lot more things we could look at, but that's just, that's just one thing in that. But let's keep on going. Let's, let's go further. And we look at what Jesus said. So as we pray, we're, we're praying all the time. And then I want us to look at what Jesus says. And you say, but Pastor Jennifer, he didn't say the word prayer. But we look at, and let's go ahead and look at the next slide. Remember what Jesus said? You know what he said. Okay? He said what? I am the vine. You say, but Pastor Jennifer, that's not what it says. Yes, but that's what it... That's what he's talking about there. In John 15, 5, he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Abide in me, abide in me. And you may say, yes, but he's, he didn't say anything about prayer there. What do you think happens when our lives are filled with prayer? We're abiding. We're abiding. What does abide mean? Abide is a really nice spiritual word. What does abide mean? That's a nice Bible word. Let's bring it into the 21st century. Come on. Okay, Gloria. Gloria took test all this week. So I know she has a good translation. I know she has a modern translation for the word abide. Can you give us one, Gloria? Stay. stay. Okay. Stay is good. Somebody else said what? Attach to. Attach to? Okay, that's good. Okay, somebody else? Hold on. What? Hold on. Hold on. Yeah, hold on. Okay. Anybody else? Connect. Connect. Somebody said dwell. Somebody said dwell. Okay, all of those help to describe what it means abide. And there's another one even, I like, I like all of these. And abide in the traditional sense as it was used in the Bible actually meant live with, make your home with. Make your home with. That's, that's the, at its literal meaning, that's what it means. And so Jesus says to his disciples, to you and to me, make your home with me. Live with me, hold on to me, dwell with me, commu uh, uh, all of these things, all of these things. And we do that 
We do that in many ways, but one of the primary ways we do that is through what? Prayer. It's through prayer. That is when we are, that's when we have the strongest sense of, Lord, I'm with you and you're with me as we make time throughout our days in prayer. Let's look at the next one. And what do we see? We see and this next one. What does he say? There's no verse there, but you know what verse fits with that. What was the verse? That's right. You will bear much fruit. Jesus says when you abide with me, when you make your home with me, when you hold on, when you hold on to me, when you all, all of these things, when you're connected with me, you will bear much fruit. Now, we're going to have the Global Outreach Day, the end of May. Does fruit mean we're going to bring many people to the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. But is that the only thing it means? No. In fact, here, when Jesus talks about bearing fruit, the first emphasis is not even, the first emphasis is not bringing other people to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. The first emphasis is, you will be like me. You will bear much fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Joy, peace, all of those things. Patience, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, meekness, faith, temperance. That's the King James or whatever. All of those things. That's the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit comes as the Spirit makes His home in our lives. We abide with Him. We stay connected with Him. And we bear much fruit. Do you know all these, things, all these things that we're talking about, we want to grow, that the Lord wants us to grow. The Lord is making us like, the, like Himself. He's making us like Himself. Do you remember what it says in Genesis? When God made man. Hold on to this and think, bring it back full circle. Oh boy. <laughs> but this, is, this will be a good place to stop. This will be a good place to stop. Think with me. So Jesus said, you will bear much fruit. He said, abide with me. Stay connected to me. You will bear much fruit. Now, that's in John. And John in the New Testament, especially the beginning of John, but all of John, do you know that the book of John has, one of the, has maybe the strongest connections to the book of Genesis? Did you know that? John and Genesis, book of Revelation too, but John and Genesis are so strongly connected Remember how John begins? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. He came in. He was a light. Now, go back to Genesis. In the beginning, all oh, God created. So we have that. Now, think with me as we come to a close, and we're still talking about prayer and growth this morning and abiding in Christ. How did God make men and women in the very beginning? Think back to Genesis. Think back to Genesis. What are the words that are used? There you go. God made man in His image. In His own image. God made man like Himself. Like Himself. And then man disobeyed. And you and I have disobeyed as well. And you and I have rebelled against the Lord. And we fa we'd fallen away. And then He brings us back to Himself. And God puts His Spirit in us. And as we abide and dwell with Him, what is God doing in you, in me, in His creation? He's restoring His image in us. He's restoring His image in us. He is making us like Himself. That's what it means to grow. That's what it means to be built up. All of these things. He's restoring His image in us. And as we grow, we become like Jesus. And so when Jesus says, remain in me, abide in me, and when you do, you will bear much fruit. And what Jesus means, first of all, there is, you will grow to be like me. You will be restored to the image of what God made you and planned for you to be from the very beginning. And brothers and sisters, He gives us the privilege, the precious gift of prayer as one of the ways that that can happen. He didn't have to, but He chose to. So we come to a close this morning. It's time to close. We want to close in prayer this morning. Would you join me as I pray? You pray too. And if you have been looking at prayer as a burden 
or you've not done a lot of it recently, let the Holy Spirit bring you back to God's great privilege and God's great gift in your life and my life. And that is He wants us to abide with Him and live with Him. And He uses prayer primarily in our lives to do that. Lord, we come to You this morning. And Lord, we just present ourselves before You. God, our minds cannot comprehend how You would be so happy and so pleased that we would pray and that we would spend time with You. God, the mess that we are sometimes, the mixed up ways that we are sometimes, and yet even in that way, You say, come to me, abide with me, hold on to me, live with me, and let me live with You. Lord, please help us. We, we really need help. We really need help. But Your Word promises us that You will help us. Lord, Your Word says that when we don't know how to pray and when our prayers are weak, that You will help us pray. Lord, help us open our eyes to the privilege and the precious gift and promises available to us when we pray, when we abide with You, when we devote ourselves to Your Word, when we devote ourselves to fellowship, to sharing together across a table, and to prayer. Oh God, oh God, work in our hearts, work in our lives. Change the way that we think and forgive us for thinking poorly and badly and grudgingly about prayer. Lord, every one of us, every one of us could say that. We don't want to think that way. Change our thinking. And Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, in this area. Help us, Lord, every one of us. God, for each one of us that is, that this is our prayer this morning, Lord, make a difference, we pray, even today. Lord, that as we go throughout this day, Lord, just help us. And God, for some of us, it's going to feel a little bit weird or a little bit strange. But Lord, that as we go through this day and as we go through tomorrow, we're going to live with you and dwell with you and keep an open door of communication with you throughout the day in all the activities of our lives in these days ahead because you want to be part of them. Oh, Lord, help us, we pray, every one of us. And we will say thank you because we can't do it by ourselves. But Lord, you will do it as we hold on to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We